Good morning, everyone. We are continuing our study of the um, passage that Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. We began this study last week, and today we'll continue to uh, make some comments on this passage and um, conclude it today. But it, let's read the passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for us, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In last week's lesson, we... Um, In last week's lesson, we uh, talked about how that God tells believers what we were before we were saved by grace through faith. And in the first three verses, he shows that we were dead. Uh, we were dead, you see, he said, in our transgressions and our sins. We were spiritually dead. We were dominated. We were disobedient, he says in these verses. We were defiled. We were doomed, damned. And then he goes on to tell us in the next uh, uh, three or four verses what we are as believers who have been saved by the grace of God. He says we're alive. We've been raised to a, a very lofty position. Not only did he make us alive, but he gave us a lofty status. Uh, we are uh, given a royal status. He seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. And then Paul tells us what made the difference, or as we saw last week, who made the difference. And we saw that it's all about God. It's about what God did, not what you did, or what you do, or what you are. God, in his initiative, he has intervened. But God, Paul says. You see, you, if you are a believer saved by faith, uh, you and I, we were dead. We were dominated. We were disobedient. We were damned. We could do nothing to save ourselves, but God has acted. But God, he says, who is rich in mercy, but God, he says, who is in his great love and because of his great love, loved us even when we were dead and even when we were disobedient and rebels. God made us alive together with Christ. God, he says, raised us up. God seated us. It's all about God. And we see this throughout. When Paul starts preaching the gospel, it's about God doing the acting. And if so, if the verb that has to do with salvation is in the active voice, God is the subject. If the verb is in the passive voice, we're the subject, you see. We're being acted upon. And this reminds us, we saw last week, of the great cost our, of our salvation um, that it was to God. It's free to us, but it was very, very costly to God. Um, he, he points this out uh, in verse 7. He says, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. And that points us back to chapter um, 1, verse 7, where Paul says, 
that in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You see, it was very costly to God. It cost him his own son. We were redeemed through his blood. That's how we receive the riches of this grace. And it points us back to what he says in this chapter, chapter 2, a little bit farther down, verse 13, when Paul says, But now in Christ, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And finally, we saw last week as well uh, that God demonstrated his saving grace in the freeness of our salvation. Because he says in our passage, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Salvation by grace is a salvation that's free. It's a gift. It's a free gift. He says, this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So it is through faith that this gift of God is received. And this agrees with scripture everywhere. Paul would say in Romans chapter 3 and in many other passages as well, God presented Christ as an appeasement of his wrath. Propitiation is another word for it. Through the shedding of his blood, he, he appeased his own wrath. Through the shedding of his son's blood, he said, to be received by faith. And so that's what we saw last week. We saw that um, these different things, what we were, what we are now, if we're saved by grace through faith, and what made the difference or who made the difference, and how costly our salvation was to God. Free to us, but very costly to God. Now today, I would like to continue this study, and I want to talk about what God's saving grace produces in believers. You see, a gift like this produces some things. One of the things that it produces is assurance. Um, another is peace. I've never felt peace before anything like this until I came to understand the grace of God and really understand it. There's a peace that, that is inside of you that you can't explain. And, and, and we have assurance because now it's all on God. Uh, John said in 1 John chapter 5, verse 13, he said, I've written these things, this book, 1 John, I've written this uh, to you who believe in the name of, of the Son of God. Well, why, John, did you write this to believers? He said, so that you might know you have eternal life. We can know, we can have assurance that we have eternal life. And... Um, John, in fact, says this in his, uh, what we call the Gospel of John, uh, the fourth, what we would uh, sometimes call the book of the New Testament. John said, I wrote this, I wrote this Gospel about Jesus Christ, so that you might believe that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. We can know that we have eternal life because it's a gift it and it motivates us you see to to uh, to uh, uh, have this assurance as well and as we'll see to obey later but this is one of the promises of the new covenant we are motivated by this gift to obey god uh, god made this promise way back in ezekiel chapter 36 verse 27 when he said I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Well, how? How, how does a gift of salvation like this create gratitude? Well, when you and I work for something, for a paycheck, uh, when we get it, you know, we don't say, man, that's the most amazing thing in the world. No, it was owed to us. But if someone came up to you and just gave you a bunch of money that was maybe your monthly salary, and you didn't do a single solitary thing for it, you see, that would create within you a spirit of gratitude. And what does the scripture say? It says, God 
Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who um, works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, their faith is credited as righteousness. And we read in Philippians 1.29, it has been given to you on behalf of Christ to believe in him. So when we are living in reality of this, uh, uh, of this gift, in light of this reality that we're saved by grace and salvation is a complete gift to us, um, that creates a, a spirit of gratitude. We're full of gratitude. It causes us to be grateful people. And so what would uh, the New Testament say in the Old Testament as well in many situations? Uh, places. In every situation, what do we do? We give thanks. We, we pray to God with gratitude, you see. Uh, whatever we do, in word or deed, we give thanks to God. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 um, uh, points out that we give thanks in all circumstances. We can do that because we've been saved by the grace of God. And so it causes us to be grateful it causes us to have this peace because we have assurance it also helps us to be causes us to be hopeful and uh compassionate in our attitude toward the lost because we know that what was uh what we have was a complete gift is undeserved and so we know that same gift is available for anybody else as well but it also pr produces humility in this passage, he says, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. That means you don't deserve it. You don't earn it. It's grace. And it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not by works. And then he says, so that no one can boast. Salvation by grace, a complete gift, excludes all boasting. Now, boasting is an expression actually a pride. When you have pride, it comes out in boasting. And the most despicable form of pride is religious pride or moralistic pride, where you look down your nose at someone else you think you're better than. But you see, being saved by the grace of God doesn't allow for that. It doesn't allow for boasting. It doesn't allow you to think that you're better than anybody else. It, you see, there's no room left for boasting because your salvation has nothing to do with anything you do. Nothing you've done, nothing you are, nothing that you presently are doing or trying to do or you haven't done forms any, any part of the cause or the basis upon which God saves you in his rich mercy and his great love towards you. And so... God saves us without our help. He saves us without any consideration of what we have or have not done. So God saves us in a way that completely shuts out boasting. Well then, if this is true, does that mean that it doesn't matter how we live? I hope you're asking that question. Why? Because then maybe you're understanding what Paul is teaching here and what is taught throughout Scripture. You see, it was the same question that Paul had to address many situations, in many uh, situations as he traveled around the world. He taught in synagogues. He taught in all kinds of uh, places, in private and in public. And, he, and one of the objections that came up to his preaching, you know, he said in Acts chapter 20, uh, he says, my only aim, he said, is to, um, my only aim is to, um, is to preach the gospel of God's grace. And so when he got through preaching grace, people immediately would say things like this, you're saying that we can just keep on sinning, Paul. If, if what you say is true, we're saved by grace, and it has nothing to do with what we 
do or say or are or don't do, you're saying we can live any way we want to. You're saying that we don't have to obey God's law. That's exactly what people brought up to Paul, and that's why he addresses it after talking about grace, for example, in Romans chapter 5 so much. He has to immediately address these objections that he knows are coming up in their mind because he was confronted with these objections time and again. And so if we're not preaching grace the way that Paul preached grace, the way that God wants it preached, you see, uh, if we're preaching it that way, it's going to cause people to ask that question. But if, if people aren't asking that question, we need to check to see how we're preaching grace. Do you see this? When Paul got through preaching grace, people came to the conclusion that, Paul, if what you're saying is true, we can live any way we want to. God's law, obeying God's commands, it doesn't matter. You see, I want to ask you that question. When you get through preaching about grace, would, when you get through with it, would anybody ever come up to you and say, you know, you're saying we can live any way we want to. We can just sin and we don't have to obey God. You know, the way I grew up preaching grace, nobody would have ever said, well, you're, are you saying we can live any way we want to? Nobody would have ever said that. See, what I'm saying is this. Um, if when you preach grace, if they don't at least think this, that you're saying people can live any way they want to, that's a litmus test really on whether or not we're teaching grace the way Paul preached it, the way God teaches it in the Bible. If it doesn't lead people to at least think that, well, you're saying you can live any way you want to, you can sin all you want to, you don't have to obey God then you're not preaching grace the way Paul did. Now, in the denomination I grew up in, nobody would have ever, when you got through telling them what they needed about God's salvation, the way they felt it was you know, taught, nobody would ever say, well, you're saying we don't have to do anything. We, we don't have to obey God. Nobody would have ever said that. Paul said it's by grace. You don't merit it, deserve it, earn it that you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift. It's not by works. No one can boast. And so you look at those statements, grace, not of yourselves, gift, not by works. No one can boast. You see, God demonstrates his grace toward us in not only what he, in his own sovereign initiative, has done to rescue us and save us, and not only in the freeness of, in which he gives us this salvation, but also in the walk that his saving grace produces in us. I want you to listen to this uh, next verse. In, in verse 10, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I want you to notice we're saved by grace alone. And we believers who are saved by grace alone are his handiwork. Again, it's, we don't save ourselves by anything we do. We're his handiwork. We're his handiwork from first to last. We are created anew by God, for something. Well, what is it? He says, for to do good works. That means the product of our salvation by grace alone um, is good works. It's not the cause of our salvation. It's the product. It's unearned. Um, you, you can't just, you can't say, um, um, well, I work for it but it was, uh, it was unearned. You see, you can't say that. that they, they don't mix. Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling said this. He was a journalist, a British journalist. He said, East is East and West is West and never the twain shall meet. Well, using Kipling's words, Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, grace is grace and works is works, and never the twain shall meet. 
because Paul says if it's by grace, it's not by works in Romans 11, verse 6. Because if it's by works, he says it can no longer be grace. You can't mix the two. It's, it's like a vacuum. You, it's either a vacuum or it's not. You don't put a little air in a vacuum and say, well, it's an air-enhanced vacuum. No, it's either a vacuum or it's not. You know, when someone's pregnant, they're either pregnant or they're not. You don't say, well, she's kind of pregnant. No, she's either pregnant or she's not pregnant. You're either saved by grace and it's undeserved and unearned, or you're saved by works. Again, Paul says, Romans chapter 11, verse 6, if it's by grace, it's not by, it cannot be by works. Because if it was by works, it would no longer be grace. You can't mix the two. So good works are not the cause of our salvation, but good works are the result of our salvation. And good works can be defined in a lot of different ways. They can be defined in terms of practical instruction that Paul gives in the second half, usually of these letters of the New Testament. The first half is filled with you know, teaching about God and what he's done for us and his grace. And then the second half, uh, many times of his letters, is filled with uh, moral directives for believers. But good works can also be those particular works that God has de uh, designed for each one of us in our lives. I want you to notice how uh, uh, God said it, how Paul says it here. He says, uh, we were created in in um, going back to verse seven, I don't have it up there. We were created in Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. These are works that God in his wisdom preordained that all believers should walk in and we particularly walk in. There are those general works, but there are those specific works, um, good works in our own particular life. We may not like the situation we're in, but God has put us in that situation so that we might do good works in that situation and we might glorify God uh, in that situation. You see, he saved us for good works. Now, this is an amazing statement. Um, it tells us again that we're not saved by doing good works, but we are God's good works. We're his handiwork, and God doesn't do shoddy work. He always finishes what he started, unlike you and me. He, he saved us for this purpose. So again, we don't do good works to be saved. Um, we do them as a result of being saved. And uh, it, it's God's grace that produces these good works in us. You know, God... When he saves us, he rarely takes us immediately into heaven. He leaves us here. We continue to live lives uh, in this world that he shapes and he crafts and he molds by his grace. We become a new people. We become a new creation. We have new desires. We have new appetites. We don't enjoy the things that we used to enjoy. And we do now enjoy things that we didn't enjoy previously. You see, we're created anew in Christ. We live a new life. Grace is productive. God is the master workman, and he continues to work in us to will and to do uh, of his good pleasure. And he has various tools that he uses. He uses, we call those tools, by the way, the means of grace. He has instruments. He has means of helping uh, to us to do these good works, public worship, preaching, private, or, or a public reading of God's word, even the trials and difficulties of life that he brings into our lives. You see, this is the master craftsman. He's working through all of these and many other means as well to mold us and shape us into the image of his son. And so in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, he says, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on into completion until the day uh, Christ returns for us. 
So Paul has drawn our attention to the person of saving grace and to the demonstration of his saving grace. But there's something else that Paul uh, teaches us about uh, saving grace in this passage that is very, very profound. In fact, if you really get a hold of this, it will revolutionize your entire perspective on life. And that is, he tells us uh, in um, this passage that he saved us in order that in the coming ages, he might um, show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, you remember the illustration I used last week about um, the corpse that was dead and someone was offering that corpse a diamond worth $10 million. If some, I said last week, you know, if you have a corpse there and you try to offer it a $10 million diamond, all they do is have to reach out and take it and they can have the $10 million, uh, $10 million diamond. Well, they're not going to do that. Corpse isn't going to do that. It's dead. It has no desire for that $10 million diamond. It, it cannot reach out and accept that $10 million diamond. But we pointed out last week, what if some stranger walked up to this dead person and made them alive and then offered them the $10 million diamond? Well, then they could receive it. They could accept it. They could be grateful for it, you see. But I want to ask you a question. If that happened, let's say that happened to you. You were dead. Someone offers you a $10 million diamond. You don't desire it. You don't want it. You're dead. But they make you alive. And now they offer you a $10 million diamond and they walk away. Um, what would you do? Would you just stick it in your pocket and say, cool, <laughs> neat? No, the first question that would come to your mind is, why did they do that? Why? Well, Paul has been explaining what God in his grace has done for us. He made us alive. He seated us in heavenly realms. He's offered us something that's worth much more than just a $10 million diamond. He's rescued us from eternal hell. He's, he's made us alive when we were spiritually dead. You see, we were his enemies. We were wicked. We were rebels. We were walking according to society, the way they think. We were dominated by their ways. We were disobedient to him. We were defiled. We were doomed. Yet God, in his rich mercy, his great love, sent his only begotten son, and he has given us this salvation as a completely, totally, absolutely free gift. But why? Well, we don't know all the reasons, I'm sure, but we know the ultimate reason. Paul gives us the ultimate reason why God did this for us in verse 7. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. You see, in order that gives us purpose. If he's telling us that this is the purpose that God saved us by his grace. He said, so that in the coming ages, that means in all future eternity, God might do something. What is it that he might show, that he might put on public display the incomparable riches of his grace express, expressed in his kindness toward us? That's just an amazing thought right there. First of all, let me ask you, who's the audience, by the way? God planned this public display, but who's the audience? Well, certainly the human race is part of the audience, but so are angels, so are rulers of the air and heavenly places. They're part of the audience. Uh, the chap, uh, Paul tells us in uh, chapter three, he says, uh, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly realms. Even the powers of darkness, even Satan and his demons are part of the audience. 
God is vindicating himself against all the slander and all the lies that the evil one has been spewing out of his mouth ever since he lied to our first parents in the garden. God's ultimate purpose in saving us is to glorify himself. And he puts us on public display in order to do that. And this is, and we read this repeatedly throughout scripture. You read uh, these expressions, uh, for his sake, for his name, for his glory. You read that all the way through scripture, you see. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 14, 13 and 14, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So you see, we don't receive the Holy Spirit until we were saved. And he said, that happened when you believed. And he said, the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. Why, Paul? To the praise of his glory. You see, this is the purpose God had in saving us, to the praise of his glory. And we see this several times in verse 12. He says that we might be for the praise of his glory uh, in verse 6 of chapter 1. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has given freely. Uh, he has given us freely in the one he loves. Now, this raises a question. And that is, why is God so passionately committed to his own glory? This is his supreme purpose, his own glory. Why? It would be wrong if you and I were committed to our own glory. But why is God so committed to his own glory? Well, there's several reasons, but I'm going to give you a couple of reasons. God must be supremely committed to his own glory. If God was not committed to his own glory, or for God to be committed to anything else would be for him to be committed to something that was less than that which is our highest good. Because you see, our highest good is uh, his glory. And of course, that would be sin. God must be committed to his own glory because God is righteous. But secondly, God's committed to his own glory because he's so loving. What's the connection, you might say, between his love and being committed to his glory? It's loving to exalt his own glory because knowing him is our highest happiness. There's nothing but God that can truly satisfy us and make us truly happy. Because he's the most lovely, he's the most satisfying being in the entire universe. We were made to enjoy him forever. And the glory that he seeks to magnify, he tells us in this verse, is um, the kindness that he's expressed uh, toward us in these incomparable riches of his grace. He wants to exhibit the most extra, in the most extravagant manner this all-surpassing uh, riches of his grace. And who does God put on stage in order to exhibit the riches of his grace? Us, believers. He says, in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Do you not see the wonderful purpose that this gives to our life as believers? You see, our life is, is bigger than just, you know, what's going on with us and our, our, our problems. In saving us by grace for good works, we're on display to the entire universe, to the glory of God. And God is vindicating himself. He's glorifying himself before all the principalities and all the rulers and all the powers, all the authorities in heavenly places and on earth. And we are part of that. It's as though, he's, it's as though he has, uh, is doing that and putting us on public display. That's what he's doing. And he's doing, us he's doing that now. That's our purpose in life. 
And I'll tell you what, if we could only get a hold of this, we tend to be so introspective. We tend to be so self-centered, so self-focused, so self-preoccupied, so self. But may God help us to remember we were made for something much bigger than me, myself, and I, and my problems. Remember the cause, the glory and honor of God is at stake in the way that we conduct ourselves at all times, in the way that we live, in the way that we respond to every situation, all the trials of life that we're going uh, that we are in. We're tempted, even when we're tempted to sin, all of these, you see, the way we respond brings glory to God. Remember who you are, you see, when you are saved by grace. Remember why God saved you. Remember, it's for his honor and his glory. Think about what a privilege it is to be used by God to glorify him before angels, before demons, before Satan, before the entire world. Think about the glorious uh, graciousness of God. Think about your royal status. You are uh, saved by grace, undeserving ambassador of God himself. Think about the tremendous price that was paid. You see, is there not something in this glorious good news message that's bigger than yourself? Something that's really worth living for? Something that's worth dying for? You know, I've told you these stories because they really affected me of these young people in Oregon, you know, that if they were Christians, they got killed. Or in uh, Kenya, and if they were Christians, 168 of them, they got killed. Everybody else was released. I'm telling you something. We live for something that's really worth living for. We, die, we have something that's really worth dying for. And we need to constantly remind ourselves of these things, what we once were, what we are now, who made the difference, grace and grace alone. And why has God done it? So that he can put us on public display and show the glory of his saving grace and his kindness to us, toward us in Christ Jesus. And God's showing this right now. If you come to our house, or if you check our Facebook page, or if I go to your house, or I check your Facebook page, you see, you'll see the same thing, but you come here, you will see pictures of our children and our grandchildren up on the wall or on Facebook. We show off pictures of our family and we're proud of them. We say, now this is when they graduated from high school and this is when they, and we're proud of them. That's what parents and grandparents do. That's what God is doing. He's saying to the principalities and powers and authorities in heavenly places and in the world, he said, you see that woman over there? She came from a, a godless, dysfunctional family. During her teenage years, she was a serial fornicator. She had no use for the church, no use for believers. But during her senior year in college, I introduced her to a believer who befriended her. And I had this believer tell her the good news about my saving grace. And she put her faith in me alone to save her. At first she resisted. She kept drawing back. But one day I opened her eyes and she could see how lost she was and how that she needed uh, my son. And now you look at her. She's got the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ in her. She's a humble, gracious, devoted believer to my glory. He's putting that lady on display. He says to the principalities and powers and authorities in heavenly places and in the world, see that man over there? He was a church leader's kid. Oh, he knew all the Bible stories and he, he went to church all the time, but it was really nothing to him. His real interests were elsewhere. They wasn't in church. His interests were sports. His interests were 
was sex, his interest was money. Those were his God. And I had to show that man. I had to show him what a self, selfish, lustful, religious hypocrite that he was. What, what a problem that he had with idolatry of putting himself first and making himself the center of everything. But I convicted him and I converted him. And now look at him. He's a trophy for me. He's a trophy of my saving grace. You see, we can go on and on telling stories like that. That's what God's doing, and he's doing it right now. Now, there's going to be a day in which we have a great uh, ceremony, graduation ceremony, you might say. And um, it's, it's called the Supper, the Great Supper of the Lamb. And when this happens, we read about it, in fact, in, in Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 9. When this happens, and this great supper of the Lamb happens, God's going to make a great, great exhibition, and you and I are going to be put on public display for all the principalities, powers, authorities in this world and heavenly places, Satan himself and demons. They're all, we're going to be put on public display for the honor of God. We read about it in Revelation chapter 7. Listen to this. John said, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And listen. All the angels standing around the throne and the four and 20 elders, when you read this, they fell down on their faces and they worship God. And they said, pray, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And this is going to be the great question that people ask. These in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? John said, that's what they ask him. And John said, I answered, sir, you know. And this is what John was told. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. That's what's going to happen. You see, that's grace. Marvelous, wonderful, superabounding grace, infinite grace. Well, may God help us to appreciate that. And uh, we uh, ask that we praise his 